We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I'm Nita Chan, you're watching Indian Open. Let's go straight to the headlines at this hour. Oil prices fell after OPEC and its allies failed to decide on a production cuts on day one of the meeting in Vienna. The cabinet approves the sale of 52.6% stake in REC to Power Finance Corporation at the current market price. The deal will add nearly 11,000 crores to the government kitty. HCL Technologies will buy select software products from IBM for $1.8 billion. The deal is likely to be completed by mid-2019. And voting begins for 200 assembly seats in Rajasthan and 111, 119 seats in the state of Telangana. And boy, I tell you, I don't think there is anything more important uh, than what happens to the Indian exit polls and in the Indian state election results uh, over the next three days. Frankly, just keep that at the back of your mind when you are approaching trade this morning. Let's talk about trade this morning, though, and maybe what happened overnight in the U.S. markets as well. So it was, um, yeah, while you could argue that it was a rather tough day, but if you just look at what happened to the U.S. markets on an intraday basis, the stocks closed off the day's lows post the tech stocks putting a rally. So Dow Jones about a third of a percent lower, S&P in the red, but Nasdaq ended well and truly in the green. Um, also adding some bit of positivity, that's Nasdaq for you, about half a percent higher. Also what added some bit of positivity was two regional Federal Reserve presidents urging policy caution uh, because of the volatility in the markets and the question marks over the U.S. economic growth. And all of this makes now the 19th December Fed meet and the commentary that comes from Jerome Powell and the Fed very, very important. Arguably, this becomes the most important policy from the Fed for the current calendar year, to be honest. Uh, and uh, that, I mean, while we are talking about what's happening to the S&P and the Nasdaq over the last few days and the kind of meltdown that we've seen, yesterday was a different case in point, the recovery. But remember, we, we are right now at levels wherein the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq are actually uh, in the in, in the worst period on a, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis since what's happened in 2011 as well. So the market position isn't quite spectacular. However, if indeed the Fed changes its tone materially on Fed on December 19th, then that could aid a little bit to the markets. From an Indian market perspective, what's also very important is crude, and we'll have a detailed discussion on this. But remember, crude has corrected nearly 3% after OPEC meeting ended with no details on production cuts. Yes, it is day one, and yes, OPEC has said that they have delayed the decision on the production levels uh, only till Friday, which is today. So let's see if there is something that comes about today. But on the back of an inconclusive day one, the crude prices came off about 2.7 or 2.8 percent overnight in trade. 59.68 is where it's trading right now as well. So, if people were anticipating any kind of big um, cartelization of sorts and that might lead to crude prices higher, day one hasn't shown any evidence of that, and that might only augur well for the sentiment on Indian markets. To be honest, speaking of Indian markets, uh, there was a, the late momentum in the U.S. markets could well aid our markets in the session today. Um, keep in mind that while there is significant call writing and shop build up on the future side as well, um, on select strikes including 10,700, there is the exit poll. So, um, outcome that will come out today evening and I think a lot of traders would be wary of what happens if indeed the exit polls indicate a market favorable verdict in the state elections and if that were to be the case then the kind of short covering that could come about on Monday so I wouldn't be surprised that even if there are shorts in the system there might be some bit of covering frankly if you look at the Asian screen right now and the SGX Nifty it does certainly points towards some bit of an uptick on open itself so it'd be very very interesting to see how the shorts over the last two two and a half sessions uh, react in early morning trade today, keeping in mind that there is uncertainty coming in later part of the day or post-market hours today. 
I would be really surprised if a, a fair bit of short positions get piled on in today's session as well, unless uh, those piling on the shorts know something that the market doesn't. However, um, all of that we'll get to know during the course of the day. Let's try and figure out what could happen at 9, 9.15 a.m. Three or four stocks that, to my mind, are the standout words in, in the session today. One of them, of course, um, is PFC. And there's a cabinet nod for the sale of the 52.6% stake in REC to PFC. I'll get into the details on first word in a bit, but suffice to say the stock's been under pressure. I would really doubt if there is a massive upside to this. Um, I don't quite know what kind of downtick comes in because this news was known, but we'll still try and tell you the counters, uh, contours of the deal as well. But the stock remains in focus firmly today. Uh, it's CL Technologies. Uh, now, you know, long accused of not utilizing cash effectively, IT companies are now starting to do that via buybacks, via acquisitions, and yet another one, and an interesting one. The HCL Tech is going to buy select IBM software products for about $1.8 billion. That's a fairly large deal as well. Uh, should consume it by mid-2019. The total addressable market of the acquired products is more than $50 billion. Should be interesting to see how HCL Tech reacts in the session today. Remember, CLSA put HCL Tech as the top buy in their uh, call calls yesterday. Uh, should be interesting to see how its CL Tech reacts. My guess is maybe marginally positive. Uh, Gale, CLS has turned bearish on the stock. Uh, the UN, they say that the US LNG arbitrage may stay negative through 2019, and they are predicting that there is a high probability of the pet cam business showing an EBIT loss in quarter three, and which is why they have slashed the target price to 420 from 465. So do watch out for Gale. And speaking of oil and gas, because of the crude price fall, otherwise, let's see if there is activity in BPHP, RSE, or emission names, or the paint names really interesting but maybe a lot of people would not want to preempt too much because what happens to oil prices remains to be seen and that's the starting point on first word today what happens to oil prices if OPEC and its allies fail to arrive on a consensus on production cuts we speak to Sri Pavakar Siu of FGE and Bob Kino of Tethys Partners. Steel stocks take a hit as demand, supply and cost dynamics take turns Our Dashan Mehta lays out the factors at play. We also dwell on the PFC REC deal that's been approved by the cabinet. It's likely to put significant strain on PFC's books. And the fourth tranche of the CPC ETF not only lines up government's coffers, weightage of the stocks may rise on Indian and global benchmarks. Yatin Mota tells us how. The Russian president is clearly more important right now than his U.S. counterpart, for the OPEC at least. Uh, the Association of Oil Producers stopped short of announcing a production cut, despite all members agreeing that nations should lower output. The consensus, it seems, is a cut of about a million barrels a day. It's now up to the non-OPEC members to decide. Russia is expected to declare its decision today, which in turn will prompt all the other producers to cut or maintain the status quo. Crude prices? have for trading or have been trading with nearly with the cuts of nearly a percent right now as well so how is it going to pan out let's put that question to two experts and let's start off with Sri Paravar Karisu Karasu of FGE who joins us right now from Singapore studio Sri thanks so much and excuse me if I mispronounce your name but the moot question is how have you oh, read <laughs> thanks so much uh, the moot question is how have you uh, gauged uh, what happened um, in the, on day one of the OPEC meet yesterday? Seemed some surprises uh, from the Saudi minister, if not all. Uh, okay, and there are a few things we need to understand here. Uh, historically, if you look at OPEC meetings, right? I mean, a decision is usually taken, and then OPEC goes into this meeting. But it's a very unique situation we have in hand today for a number of reasons. Uh, and we think there could be like three likely scenarios which can come out of like today's meeting. Uh, the first scenario is you know possibly a one million barrel per day agreement on production cut. Now this depends on you know probably 150 KBD uh, production cut agreement from Russia. What this means to market? Uh, this will be taken as quite bearish Nero. I mean we did see crude drop by about three four dollars yesterday. Uh, since no decision was made in the meeting and 1 million barrels per day will be seen as a bearish signal. It's not going to help the market at all. Uh, clearly 1.3 million barrels per day is a level which we think can do something. Uh, again, this is not going to help crude prices recover anytime soon, but at least it could help arrest the drop in the crude prices what we are seeing from 
uh, yesterday. And for this, we clearly need Russia to cut down by about 250 kBD, which is probably the heart of the issue now. Uh, Russia has been reluctant to cut uh, 250 kBD. They've been uh, sticking to like 100, 150 kBD levels. So uh, it's it's extremely confusing at this moment. And even for us, it's, it's very difficult to come up with a clear direction of uh, what could happen by uh, end today. But we think uh, Shri, some, anywhere from 1 to 1.3 million barrels per day is like from, from whatever transpired yesterday in the commentary surrounding this OPEC meet as well, it doesn't seem like there is going to be a big yeah. production cut. So we may not quite know the exact levels, but it doesn't seem like there is a material upward yeah. direction or an upward risk to crude prices in the near term at least. Hello? No, clearly no. I mean, we are talking about downside risk now. I mean, whatever decisions are being made or will be made today still, you know, takes us to a point where we will think how much crude prices are going to fall at from here. So there's clearly no upside risk from now uh, through like early uh, next year, uh, not only because of OPEC, but we should also remember U.S. production is growing massively in the last three months. Uh, I know I'm slightly deviating from the OPEC topic, but it's very important to know what's happening in the U.S. Uh, production has gone up by 900 kbd in the last three months so even if opec decides to cut 1.3 million barrels per day which you know is really on the higher side of expectations it's not going to help the market we, we will still see stocks growing through early part of next year so there's much more downside risk today than uh, upside risk Okay, Shri, my, my, my final uh, question, I mean, you know, the fact that the Saudi energy minister, I, I thought he spoke about two important things from an Indian perspective. One is that he's saying that a cut of one million barrels would be enough. Two, in line with talking about how the global world leaders uh, have been communicating with him, he also mentioned that not just Donald Trump, but uh, Prime Minister Modi's comments on how softer crude is necessary for the Indian public and Indian diaspora seem to suggest that a lot of non-US world leaders and their requests are kind of playing part out here as well. Again, I don't know if I'm reading too much, but it's unusual for us out here in India to hear such statements coming in. Uh, would you reckon that there is a possibility that post this OPEC meet, there could be, despite the larger expectation that post OPEC and some decisions taken, there could be some uptakes, there is a possibility of crude prices declining further as well? Yes, very much. That, that is what I've been uh, telling Neera. I mean, you know, one million barrels per day cut is still bearish to us you know, looking at where supply demand fundamentals are today. I mean, keep all the political factors what are in play aside for a moment. And if you look at on the fundamentals perspective, there's so much oversupplies what we have seen in the last few months that even 1.3 is not cut is not going to help us. So if they're coming up with 1 million barrels per day, consumers will be happy because we can't clearly expect crude prices fall, you know, further from what we are seeing today. Okay. Like US, India and all the key consumer nations will be quite benefited. But then we don't know this is what Saudis want. I mean, you know, they clearly feel they are tricked by the US. Uh, with all the Iran sanctions and the Khashoggi murder thing. So it's a lot of uh, things to worry about. Well, let's wait and watch. Uh, from an Indian perspective, I think uh, everyone would be happy that crude is not on an upward trajectory. That kind of uh, helps us a lot. But Sri, really yes. good having you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and joining us this early in the morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, so that's the verdict or the verdict that can be given thus far on crude prices i think day two of opec meet might actually be more conclusive than day one however it is conclusive uh, what's happening to the metal names they've lost their sheen as commodity prices have taken a hit globally steel companies in particular have been the worst hit with cuts as deep as 50 percent what's weighing in on the counters is the worst over is it even possible to say that dashan mehta joins us with a closer look of what's happening here dashan good morning good morning uh, neeraj what we've seen as far as uh, the first half was concerned the metal index was cyclical but steel stocks did extremely well now that we are moving into the second half at least of the last one one and a half months 
Uh, steel stocks certainly have seemed to decline. So if you're seeing the metal index is down almost 16% in the last uh, three months. And if you take a look at the stocks that are there in the metal index, and clearly uh, some of the counters, look at the drop that's come in. GSPL is down 51% from its 52-week high. Sale is down 50%. And even the larger companies uh, like Tata Steel is down 33%, where the restructuring is going as per plan. And GSW Steel, which was considered to be the safest stock uh, to invest in the metal index of late has actually corrected close to 31% from the 52 week high. So the trend certainly seems to be uh, you know, on the downside as far as the metal counters are concerned. Look at the valuations. Valuations have corrected significantly. Valuations for JSPL which was trading at 8 times on a 5 time EV EBITDA on a 5 year average has come down to 5.5%. Sale is down significantly and even counters like Tata Steel and JSW Steel all of them have corrected significantly from uh, you know, the 52 week high and yet despite this correction you know, brokerages like City and Nomura have come out with reports, negative reports, and they have actually downgraded the sector as such. So that's the trend that you're seeing as far as the steel sector is concerned. Now, if you're looking at uh, some of uh, the issues that are there, uh, this is the price of hot rolled uh, coil steel, and that is the benchmark that you're looking at. And over the past few months, you can steadily see that the prices of uh, the steel prices are coming off uh, significantly. So that's the first issue. Uh, the base uh, price is coming down. Now, the second second part is the fact that steel demand. If you're looking at what's happened as far as steel demand is concerned, uh, that has actually increased. But if you take a five-year perspective, right now it's, it's in December 2018, but if you take a five-year perspective, uh, you, you can always see that uh, you know, it manages to cool off from uh, you know, levels of November to because of cyclicality and issues in China, steel demand always comes down. So this is the five-year chart. If you're looking at it, basically from September, it, the trend seems to be turning down again it picks up and then again you're seeing that the trend goes down again in November December the trend seems to go down and that's the trend <clears throat> so probably over the next few months you will have uh, the China steel demand uh, go down significantly so that's the trend that you're seeing Apart from it, uh, uh, input costs are something that is uh, an issue for steel companies. Now, you, we, we spoke about how the steel prices are coming down, but the input costs are going down. NMDC has hiked the iron ore prices for the Indian companies, so that's the first whammy. Secondly, uh, you know, cooking coal spreads are rising, so that's another uh, input cost for them. So the margin spreads, the near-term hit on spreads is quite evident on steel companies, and that's why you've seen the big correction that's come in on a lot of these steel companies. Uh, if you're looking at uh, what the brokerages are saying, uh, Nomura expects prices to improve post March 2019. So till that time, they expect issues to come into the counter. Goldman Sachs expects domestic prices to continue to fall. Uh, today itself, in the morning, City came out with a report in which they downgraded all the steel counters, indicating the same things that they expect. You know, uh, spreads should be under pressure, and they expect China demand not to come in. So that's the trend. Now, what has happened is Morgan Stanley took a, a, a channel check as far as some of uh, the steel products are concerned. Uh, steel prices cut in December, what has happened? Hot roll coil sp uh, steel prices are down 1,500 rupees and long products are down anywhere between 1,500 to 2,000 rupees in India. And Indian prices are still at a premium to import. So that is another thing that impacts steel prices. So when prices are coming down, Indian prices, the global prices are coming down, Indian prices have also come off and uh, input costs are going down. And that's why the spread has come down significantly. Now, if you're looking at the recommendations at this point of time what are analysts recommending at this point of time uh, you know most of the counters uh, most of the analysts are most bullish on Tata Steel at this point of time 83% have a buy on them and 10% sell on them surprisingly JSW Steel which has till now been the best performer maximum almost 21% of the analysts have a sell recommendation on it and 56% have a buy on it sale <coughs> which has uh, been the b b uh, biggest Lagarde still has the lowest number of uh, buy recommendation among all the analysts so this is the analyst call that have come in. As far as the potential targets post the correction is concerned, uh, that is there. You can clearly see that JSPL has an 80% potential upside as per a 12-month Bloomberg target. Tata Steel has close to 40%. Uh, so the targets are steep, but uh, the fundamental doesn't seem to be going uh, some of the steel companies' way. Well, Dashan, thanks for putting that into perspective. The metal index clearly hitting multiple quarter or multiple month lows out there, and Dashan putting into perspective what could be working and what would not, what is essentially weighing in on that space. That's the Nifty Metal Index on a three-month basis has lost about 16%.
The third piece on first word today, PFC. Now the deal is in approved. Remember, we spoke about this partially yesterday. Now that uh, the sale of the government's entire 52.63 percent stake in REC to PFC has been approved. Just a small piece on what this would, what this could mean for PFC, and what are the pointers that you should keep in mind. Um, one, uh, they have to pay nearly 11,000 crores, or anywhere between 11,000 crores to 15,000 crores, depending on the pricing methodology. For this, based on the current market price, 11,000 crores. Um, this is for the entire stake. The, the assumption is that PFC might need to ra partially raise debt to fund this deal. Why is that the case? Because if you just look at the internals as of as reported in September, uh, the cash on books nearly 1,800 crores, the investments on books nearly 2,800 crores. Considering the minimum deal size is about 11,000 crores, you presume that there will be some bit of debt that the company might have to raise with an assumption, of course, and what the finance minister said that REC will become a subsidiary of PFC. Now, the impact of the assumed deal contours, I've assumed a few things, including the fact that they might uh, acquire the stake, might raise some debt, etc. So higher interest costs, if they indeed acquire, raise some debt, could well hurt the profitability of PFC in the quarters to come. There is a holding company discount which comes in uh, because PFC, REC would be a subsidiary of PFC and that mars any benefits of acquiring REC directly. There is cash going out but you don't get the full valuation for holding an asset like REC because there will be a holding company discount in play. And typically the cash on books is meant to augment the capital adequacy ratio. That vanishes and therefore that impacts the quantum of loan growth that PFC can do in the future as well. So that's something that uh, could hurt the counter and the sentiment thereof. The unknowns out is in this deal, one RBI's exemption on capital adequacy norms because car may fall below the minimum requirements when uh, this deal goes through in the shape and form that we believe it could. Um, we don't know about the quantum of borrowing from the market. Uh, there could be uh, a possible op open offer waiver for the public shareholding that might be sought. Remember, it was sought in the case of ONGC and HPCL as well. The same could happen here. We don't quite know whether that will happen. It's a case of two lenders, so the ball rests in the RBI's court firmly. And let's wait and watch if that happens. And uh, yesterday in the, in the press meet, the finance minister did mention that the pricing methodology is not yet finalized. It will be done by a committee headed by the finance minister himself. So we don't quite know whether it's happening at the current market price or whether it could happen at a bit of a premium. Remember, the stocks have come off quite a bit, so don't quite know the pricing methodology as yet. What's working for PFC, of course, until now, is that uh, the company's got a strong capital posi position thus far. The capital adequacy ratio thus far is looking okay. The ILFS exposure that PFC has um, is, is fully commissioned wind energy projects with uh, PPAs in place for all of those projects. There is no stress visible in the government sector lending, which is about 82% of uh, the loans for PFC. And the valuations have corrected in anticipation of the REC buyout. So you might argue that if they came out of a blue, then the market could be caught by surprise and there could be a reaction thereof. That might not be the case because the stock has lost quite a bit of ground. I mean, the price chart or the price to book chart, either of which come up on, come some on screen, uh, a one month or a three month price chart. The, the market price chart over the last three months essentially will show you how the price to book multiple has changed because I don't think the book value has changed too much. But just look at what's happened in the last three months when the stock has come off quite materially in anticipation of this deal. So let's wait and watch if there is a further downside to this uh, or because the details of the deal were largely known, you would presume that maybe the downsides would be contained. Let's wait and watch. PFC firmly remains a stock in focus today as well. Well, the last piece uh, on first word, the fourth piece on first word, is about the fourth tranche of the CPS ETF, comprising of shares in 11 public sector units, which received a strong response from the market. This offer, while fetching 17,000 crores to the government, will also increase the free float in all these companies once allocated. Some of these companies are on the Nifty 50 and MSCI emerging market indices. So will that have an impact on the weightages in the respective benchmarks? Yatin Mota has some answers. Yatin, morning. Uh, good morning, Neeraj. And, uh, you know, we are talking about a free fruit methodology uh, which is basically uh, applicable to nifty as well as uh, you know to the MSCI index now the free fruit uh, methodology uh, we have uh, uh, to take into account the public float now what typically happens when the CPSC issuance happens is that the government holding or the promoter holding comes down and correspondingly the public holding or the public float increases and because of the increase in float uh, post the divestment of government stake via the CPSC ETF, there are a number of stocks uh, which could see uh, increase in the weightages both on the Nifty side as well as uh, for the MSCI index uh, in the upcoming uh, you know review. 
Now, you know, uh, what uh, uh, important uh, thing that we are watching out for, according to brokerage estimates like Motila Loswal, a $25 million to $30 million inflow can be seen uh, because of uh, the, uh, you know, CPSC ETF issuance, which is ultimately increasing the free float. Uh, in the case of, uh, you know, uh, the CPSC weight, uh, we have Coal India, IOC, ONGC and NTPC. These are the four key stocks we are talking about, wherein the weightage is 19 to 20%, IOC being the highest with a 20% weight. Uh, more importantly, the float uh, that we are talking about has been increasing. Earlier, Coal India uh, current float was 22%, and post the uh, you know issuance, uh, the float will increase to as high as 24%. Similar is the case with ONGC. If you look at IOC, the float will increase by three percentage points to a level of 25%, and NTPC again. Uh, the 38% current float will increase to 41% post the divestment of Government of India. Now in the process, since the float is increasing, uh, the MSCI index, according to analyst estimate, should also go up. Uh, now, uh, if you look at uh, the four companies, Coal India, IOC, ONGC, NTPC that we are talking about, the weightages could increase by 10 basis points each for all of these companies. Uh, more importantly, if you look at it uh, for IOC, ONGC, Coal India, a 10 basis points uh, weight increase will lead to a buying of $25 million when it comes to MSCI, according to a Motilal uh, Oswal uh, uh, you know, estimate. So, uh, clearly, uh, uh, for the companies which are under pressure, have been you know, trading at multi-year lows, uh, this MSCI uh, rejig could be a you know, lifeline for investors. In fact, if you look at the valuation picture also, Neeraj, uh, you know, uh, stocks like Coal India, IOC, ONGC, NTPC, all of them are trading at single digit price to earning multiple based on fi20 uh, you know bloomberg consensus uh, estimates uh, so based on that consensus uh, you know we can clearly see a return potential which is quite high for companies like ongc coal india ntpc uh, which could be uh, you know between 30% to 45% uh, so uh, clearly on the valuation front the comfort is there we'll uh, you know need to wait and watch as to how these stocks consolidate and once the rejig happens on the nifty side as well as on the msci side uh, you know, how really do, do investors treat it? And if there is a 25 to $30 million inflow, surely these are the stocks which could bounce back, uh, you know, moving ahead. Well, let's wait and watch. The valuation certainly in their favor, if not anything else. Yatin Mota, thanks for putting that into perspective. And, well, maybe even the liquidity on the respective benchmarks too. And the weightages on the respective benchmarks. Well, that brings us to the end of first word. A lot more lined up on Indian Open. Uh, we discuss the asset quality picture for Federal Bank with Managing Director Shyam Srinivasan and decode the September quarter earnings for Muthut Finance with Managing Director George Alexander Muthut. Remember, the stock fell about 10% in trade yesterday. But after this break, we take a full tilt towards the day's trade. years of smile, services, assurance, excellence, commitment. Building beneficial relations with customers and stakeholders. Union Bank of India celebrates 100 years. Thank you for your support. RP Sanjeev Goenka Group. Growing Legacies. It's not about the award. It never is. It's about what went before and what came after. It's about getting recognized for the trust and confidence the customer has shown on us. We actually strive for it. It's about the brightest ideas and cleverest implementations. It's about innovation. It's about impact for manufacturers and help for shoppers. Tangible, meaningful impact for manufacturers who innovate and genuine help for shoppers looking for the best new things on the shelves. It's not about the award. It is about standing out. It's about being a giant even if you're really, really small. It's about picking the leaders of tomorrow, today. It's not about the award. It's about competing. It's about an unbiased, countrywide, face-to-face -face consumer survey that is unique and provides relevance and differentiation. Essentially, we're adding something to the marketing arsenal of product teams. It's about doing one's best and raising the bar each time. So it's about the end customer. You know, if you have 
that clarity? What is this need that you're trying to solve for the end customer? About exceeding expectations. About going all in. Coming. Product of the year. It's about feeling good that we are associated with product of the year. This is our 10th year. 30 years of finding brands that capture a billion. Welcome back. You're watching Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Coin, taking a look at what's been happening in the Asian market pack. Uh, so you've got some bit of uh, a pullback after yesterday's uh, decline, but um, the Nikkei marginally in the green, uh, Shanghai flat and Hang Seng also trades flat. It's more meaningful actually for the SGX Nifty because that trades with gains of more than half a percent. So after uh, breaching those levels of uh, 10,000, approaching 10,600 in fact almost breaching it towards the end of the trade we managed to close marginally above it so let's see where today's trade, trade takes us but before we uh, do any of that let's quickly get in a check on what happened in the futures and options space in the derivative market Darshan is here uh, standing by to give us an entire setup Darshan good morning good morning and uh, the SDX Nifty is currently indicating a positive outlook uh, the expectation of the Dow fall yesterday had uh, everyone worried but that recovered the SDX Nifty is also recovered but it wasn't all that good for the Nifty the Nifty was down almost 200 points in trade yesterday. We were at the 10,600 mark in trade. Uh, open interest built up of 5%, indicating that there were fresh short positions that were taken. Uh, there was long unwinding that was seen on the Nifty Bank. Open interest was down 10%. Uh, if you're looking at the weeks, the weeks also managed to come back to levels of close to 19 and a half currently. As far as where positions are being taken yesterday, uh, because of the sell-off that happened, uh, what we're seeing is that call writers have maximum open interest built up at the 11,000 level. So from levels of 10,700 to higher levels, call writers are active and from 10,700 to lower levels is where put writers are active in trade. What happened in trade yesterday since the market managed to fall in trade, call writers became aggressive and put writers had to shed positions in open interest. So at this point of time, we are close to the 10,700 mark in trade where both sides have uh, a significant amount of open interest built up. There are no stocks in the FNO band, but the Nifty PCR managed to fall significantly in trade. But surprisingly, the bank Nifty PCR managed to move in much higher. As far as stocks are concerned, first the first stock I want to highlight is just dial. Open interest built up was 13% on the short side. The counter was down almost 4% in trade. The other one is Dish TV. Again, seeing fresh shorts. Open interest built up of 10%. The FNO have the futures have moved into a discount for Dish TV. And the other few counters is the Muthut Finance. Open interest built up of 50%. Post the numbers. Remember, they came out with their numbers yesterday during market hours. It fell as high as 12% but managed to recover and close by, down by almost 6% in trade. And Indian Oil, again, seeing fresh shorts. Open interest built up of 8%. That too on the short side. All right, Darshan, thanks very much for that. So that's uh, the FNO setup as we head into trade this morning. Vineet Bulunchkar, Head of Equities and Research at Ventura Securities, is joining us on the show right now. Vineet, thanks very much for taking out the time. The first question is obviously going to be on the big news on HCL Tech and uh, uh, them uh, paying about $1.8 billion for some of I IBM's uh, products. What's the sense right now? I mean, they do have cash on the books, but is that going to cause them a little bit of a drain, the kind of money that they have to dole out for this? And what kind of a market opportunity do you see this for HCL Tech? So, you know, historically, HCL Tech has always followed a slightly different path than the other software techies. Earlier, they focused on uh, your AMC services. And now they're getting into the products, uh, which I think will add and augment their portfolio. So the stock is currently quoting at about 12x on uh, uh, the P ratio. The stock is uh, quite cheap compared to the peers. And I believe that this will be a short in arm to expand their offerings and bolster their portfolio as they go and seek uh, business with their clients. Mm. Okay, uh, we need uh, so valuation. The valuation is one piece, uh, but uh, on what is arguably the most important stock of the day, the fact that there is now a product portfolio with a large addressable size, 
what does this do if anything if they execute this successfully to multiples for hcl because historically all through these years despite showing a higher rate of growth trajectory hcl has not quite got the multiples that some of the other companies have managed to get yeah so precisely because they were into low value businesses but now with which was a bulk of their portfolio but now with this uh, IBM portfolio, if they are able to get it uh, at uh, successful valuations and not impact their cash levels too much, I believe that uh, this can be a real shot in the arm. And uh, you know, it's a it's a good trade with a lot of margin of safety. We have to understand that the IT environment is uh, uh, changing very rapidly, and uh, as you digitize and you need newer offerings, you need to go to your clients with differentiated services. So they can build a suite of uh, productized services to their clients. And uh, this is going to really be a good bolster for HCL Tech. It's interesting. I mean, um, both of us have spoken to that management for years altogether. Um, they have uh, one, one good thing about HCL, maybe compared to a few others, that is that they've not shied away from large ticket acquisitions. Uh, SAP was one. They've had a a few other string of pearls acquisitions as well, large, mid, small, and this is a reasonably large acquisition, $1.8 billion. But, but the point being that the valuations in your favor into a business which all, arguably offers you higher margins, uh, even though it brings about a little bit of volatility to the business suit, just the products business. We've seen what happened yeah. to Persistent, to be honest, and just being a large products business too. But um, with, if all of these click together, then the question mark only is, as probably Vineet said as well, is there, is there a case for the company able to get a higher PE multiple along with a better earnings growth trajectory, which might be beneficial for the stock? Well, more so because uh, you know the management has uh, uh, again said that this is going to be a strategic segment for them to be a securities, marketing, commerce segment that they are in. And it's a big market, that addressable market of $50 billion. Currently, yeah. it might expand. Yeah. yeah, so for them to make their foothold strong in this market and, you know, uh, make sure they're getting a, a big piece of the pie is something that uh, goes on in terms of their execution strategy and how they cap capitalize on this market. Yeah. But a lot of that and more also, like Vineet said, will show up in their valuations later on when they actually do uh, make sure that this works for them. Yeah, so this is one. The other one, Vineet, of course, is uh, PFC. Now that the deal is out, but a deal which was well known to the markets. You may not have it under official coverage, but do you presume that there could be further pressure on PFC or um, this is it's, it's pricing in uh, this deal already? See, already both the stocks are at 0 0.52, 0 0.53 on the price to book rate multiple, you know. So I don't see these uh, valuations get any more depressed from here. Also, you know, the government is now going to focus on uh, uh, the electrical infrastructure in the country. Uh, we are going to fall short of coal uh, power if we don't start uh, doing CAPEX right now till 2024. So, you know, the, uh, the atmosphere for coal projects is going to pick up. And I believe that uh, government might move into a mindset of resolving the uh, thermal assets rather than looking at creating new assets, uh, you know, while neglecting the already CAPEX that is being done. Uh, we have seen one resolution come in on the Adani and the, you know, the UMPP power projects. So I believe that, uh, uh, you know, from these valuations are already stressed and I don't believe that we will see much downside from these levels. But specific to PFC, I mean, um, this is definitely going to be a drain on its capital adequacy buffer, which in turn could affect growth for the company. How are you reading into these elements? Uh, to be honest, I have not uh, actually gone into the depth of PFC because it's not under a radar. So I won't be able to comment on that. Okay. That's uh, REC PFC and uh, PFC now. Uh, REC becoming the subsidiary of PFC, getting the cabinet not there, deal being approved. The stocks though in yesterday's session were subdued. 1% lower for REC, PFC down about 2.5%. Uh, well, our research team is here with us. We've got a lot more stocks to talk about. We'll go back to Vineet in just a few moments. But we've got some stocks and news, some brokerage calls. Nikki as well as Samit, both of them are here with us. Nikki, I'm going to start off with you first on some stocks and news. 
Uh, apart from uh, HAL Tech and PFC REC, we're going to be tracking a bunch of developments. I'm going to start off with Vedanta, where Indian Code is expected to reopen Vedanta's copper plant. How are we not expecting production to resume from there anytime soon, given that the state government may ag again appeal uh, for uh, the closure of the plant to Supreme Court? Coal India, where the government has sold in more than 2.2% equity uh, to CPC ETF, which is managed by Reliance Nippon Life Asset. Uh, now, the government holding in Coal India with this take sale will come down to 72.9 percent as compared to 75 percent earlier jet airways like there are bulk of developments happening in that counter the company essentially has sought a 350 million dollar soft loan from Etihad, but then uh, a mint report suggests that Etihad is expected is set to offer only 150 million loan uh, dollar loan guarantee to jet airways separately we also have development from times of india which states that the promoter has tapped nri tycoon for investment the promoters learn to have approached Abu Dhabi based NRI uh, MA Yusuf Ali. So that's one development and also the counter that we like to keep an eye out. Apart from that, NTPC, where NTPC is likely to buy government stake in SGVN. Uh, that's a PTI report that we are uh, talking about. And lastly, we're tracking in Kajaria Ceramics. That's a bulk deal. Wasatch International has bought in 0.65% uh, equity from Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, uh, has bought in more than 10 lakh shares at a price of around 435. Uh, per share, which is a discount of nearly 1 to 2% from the previous market price. All right, Nagi, thanks a lot for that. Uh, Summit, some brokerage calls? Well, a couple of them. The first one is on Sun TV, where CLSA has maintained the buy rating but have cut down the target price to 770 from 870. Now, according to the brokerage, new channel launches would boost the company's long term ad revenue. Now, along with this, the ongoing digitization mode in Tamil Nadu, TRI regulations, and tabs with all the three telecom operators could act as a catalyst for growth going forward when it comes to the subscription revenue. Now, Sun TV will be launching its Bengali channel in the fourth quarter of financial year 2019 and it is planning to invest close to 150 crore rupees in this channel. Now, on the back of this, the brokerage has increased their revenue estimate uh, for financial year 2019 and financial year 2020, but have cut their earnings estimate because they are expecting a higher earn, uh, co content cost for this channel and that's the reason they have cut down their earnings estimate by nearly 3 to 4 percent. The second we have is Bank of America Merrill Lynch on Maruti Suzuki. Now, the brokerage has maintained its underperformed rating on the stock and uh, with the target price of close to 6,850. Now, according to the brokerage, management commentary suggests that volumes remain weak despite a uh, recent drop in fuel prices. Now, weak urban demand continues to drag the overall volume, says the brokerage. Now, along with this weak pricing environment and rising incentives pose as a big risk to the company's EPS going forward. Lastly, the brokerage says that despite the recent correction, the stock remains expensive compared to other uh, two wheelers. Uh, compared to other four wheelers. Got that. Uh, Summit, thanks very much for that. I, mean, I just want to come to you uh, uh, with uh, the auto pack as a whole and Maruti in particular. Uh, from levels of 6,500 went up to 7,400 now coming back down a bit but still looking expensive uh, on valuations. What's the call here or is this an evergreen stock that you'd probably keep in your portfolio nonetheless? Actually, I have a contra call on this stock ever since the stock was in the 9,000s. And uh, although it came down to 6,300, we've seen a good uh, 18 to 20 percent uh, pullback. And uh, with the management coming in saying that it's tough to deliver double-digit growth, you know, what follows is that uh, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult and the heady valuations will start correcting eventually. A uh, couple of things that are happening out here is that not only is there a slowdown, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is contrary to what the street has been building into the stock price, Number one. Number two is the fact that, you know, as you move towards your higher priced uh, uh, portfolio, you know, the competition is going to be increasing out there. And currently, Hyundai has launched a, a very good scheme for its new car and there have been uh, good uh, uh, demand for that. So, you know, the competition is increasing in the sedan space. Uh, you are going to see increasing competition from the uh, larger vehicles, uh, competitors where Maruti historically and globally does not have a strong hold. So I think this uh, multiple needs to correct to a very reasonable level before you know you can think of looking to buy the stock. Well, let's see if that comes off. Uh, I think two days or three days ago, we had uh, Jigar Shah of Kimeng also talking about uh, how he believed that the prices for Maruti could go as low as 1500 Vinit isn't quite laying a price target out here, but he's saying that the multiples for Maruti should correct a bit. And I think there are multiple people in favor of that argument as well. Um, Vinit, uh, 
just one question you you track the cement space very very closely i know uh, there have been multiple reports of very minor price hikes um, that notwithstanding crude prices coming off might aid a little bit on the cost side as well is it a space that you might look at accumulating or would the larger market uh, play a bit of a spoil sport if indeed the stocks start to move up a bit so you know i am uh, more in favor of buying stocks uh, which are not doing too much of capex so we like acc uh, ambuja you know these are two stocks that we like uh, and uh, down south where the demand has remained firm is sagar cement is another stock that we like uh, it's got uh, leadership in terms of technology they have the strategize very right and uh, from being a very marginal and a fractional player over the year decades they have really emerged to become the thought leaders in the space so these are the three stocks uh, that are my bets and one could also look at shri cement where the entire capex is being funded through internal accruals in fact sagar cements reported in november cement sales and they were up by 36.3% at 3.15 lakh uh, million tons versus 2.31 lakh million tons the stock though didn't do much in yesterday session up about down by close to 1% Uh, Manav Chopra, head of research at uh, uh, India Bulls Ventures, is joining us on the show as well. Manav, good morning to you. What would the trade look like on the index today? The global market seems to be a little bit subdued, but no major cues coming out from there. For our markets, ten thousand six hundred stands to be an important level. Uh, see, uh, you know the markets have already seen a short-term collective decline from its recent peak. Uh, most importantly uh, 10500 on the weekly basis would be the levels to look out for i sense the markets would be quite uh, you know it can see some sort of a consolidation or a base building in the near term perspective so you know the key levels that one can still uh, look for buying at the low levels would be close to 10500 so as long as uh, these levels are sustained i think the markets uh, its trend is still intact and on the upside uh, the broader range would be towards 10800 so i think we could see some sort of a new uh, move on uh, just uh, before or the post election time so we would like to see some sort of a reversal happen but at the moment i think uh, one needs to have a neutral stance similar for the bank nifty you know the bank nifty has also declined below its key moving averages uh, and is nearing its important 200 dma which is also close to 25900 so i think uh, both the indices are nearing the important support level so uh, and you know has stiff resistance on the upside so since we are also expecting the uh, result uh, date on the 11th so i think at the current juncture there is no point taking any uh, bullish uh, taking a view on the market specifically on the directional basis but i sense there could be some consolidation in the near term manav just a small follow up uh, if you were short over the last two days would you take some chips off the table considering that the exit poll uh, exit polls come out later today absolutely i think uh, uh, you know we have seen uh, consecutive uh, four sessions decline in the bank nifty and the nifty has also decline and like i mentioned you know we are nearing important support clusters so it's a good time that one should start uh, booking profits if you are already short because nearing the important support clusters you know there could be uh, an aggressive uh, short covering rally which could also uh, lead uh, a bounce towards the resistance level and uh, you know since we have already seen a very good rally from its recent close the intraday charts are also at the oversold level so i don't sense a very immediate uh, another uh, couple of days of decline i don't see that happening so i think it's good time to take some profits off okay what about specific stocks uh, for today manav yes uh, i have two buy calls one is uh, the first is a buy on gsfc you know the prices uh if you look at the chart perspective you know it has been forming an inverse head and shoulder pattern near its uh, 200 weekly moving average which is a very good long term formation at its important uh, support clusters uh, the prices have been uh, trying to form a base around the levels of 100 and it's all about the risk reward ratio you know uh, uh, there is only uh, if we look you know the prices are right at the important support clusters and a stop loss of 100 on the lower side we expect an upside target of 115 my second call would be a sell on raymond uh was particularly you know the prices have already seen a very good rally from its 
recent lows of 595 and you know it has already seen an up move of 25 percent uh, on a short term scale prices have breached its key support areas and a trend line breakdown below key averages this could uh, see some sort of an underperformance and eventually we expect at least 8 to 10 percent decline uh, into this stock for next uh, next few trading sessions 7 uh, 8085 is a strong resistance uh, which could be the stop loss on the upside uh, 785 is the stop loss and we expect lower targets of 730 okay uh, Manav just stay on with us Rahul Shah vice president of equity advisory group at Motila Lospal Securities is also joining us on the show this morning Rahul good morning to you what would the trade be uh, from the stable of Motila Lospal right now if you have to take a play on the index or even the bank nifty hi good morning I think obviously we saw a good sell-off uh, in last two days and I think maybe we'll open on a higher note today. So my sense is I think obviously Bankex is definitely a long play from the current levels yesterday in spite of the sell-off we saw 26200 act as a very good support. So my sense is that immediate support for the bank nifty which uh, uh, technically is what we believe is a 26200. So, uh, so my sense is we can see some kind of momentum again building up from that level and it can go to 26500 or so, so another 1% uh, rise from the current level. So the best way to play is through options. So I would advise by buying 26500 call <coughs> of 13 December expiry which is close at around 188 which might open a little bit higher. So we keep a stop loss of 158 and I think that it can go to 225 or order so. Okay. And some stock ideas, you're buying LNT and you're buying Infi. Yeah. I think uh, what we've seen in uh, the trend, what we've seen in, in the, this market has been that only large caps have done quite well and, and that too also heavy weights. So in my sense, uh, obviously post results of Larson's, uh, we've seen the stock rallying quite uh, uh, quite good and, and I think we've seen uh, near term does not look like unless the stock breaks below 1360. So my sense is one should look at uh, buying Larson with a stop loss of 1368 which is a, a risk to reward is quite favorable with a target of 1430. And second is tech. So I think uh, uh, in Infosys from the tech play, I think we've seen the entire tech sector as a one done quite well and, and has act, acted as a defensive play in this markets. So my sense again uh, in large cap IT it will continue to do well so Infi, TCS both looks good on the charts but uh, Infi looks more convincingly on a future side. So my sense is one should go long on uh, Infi with a stop loss of 655 and target of 690. Okay. Uh, time now to get in our special segment Bloomberg Edge going wherein Yash Upadhyay tells us about a pattern that the Bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a stock. Yash, what's the stock on your radar today? Morning, Neeraj, and the stock is actually Indescent Bank and a sell call coming in uh, with the help of the Trender indicator. It's the proprietary uh, Bloomberg indicator and it uses uh, the average true range for calculation, helps generate uh, the buy and sell signal. Now, how do you interpret it? Uh, you go long when the Trender indicator flips its color uh, from red to green and you go short when the indicator turns from green to red. Now, when does this happen and how does that happen? Let's take a look at the chart. Uh, as you can see, uh, Indescent Bank has been falling over the last three trading sessions. What it did on Wednesday is that despite uh, falling, it managed to somehow close above the trend line. But yesterday, it opened with a gap down and it continued to weaken further. And with that, it has closed below the green line, which is the trend indicator line. Now, with that, uh, it has flipped its color and has turned red, indicating a potential downside from these current levels. So, how well does trend work for Indescent Bank, Yash? So over the last one year, five out of the seven times that the indicator has turned a negative, it would have given you an average return of close to 4.5% over the next 10 trading sessions. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, thanks a lot for that, uh, Yash. Uh, appreciate that. Well, private banks are in news. This whole thing between Yes and Kotak, then Innocent Bank looking slightly wobbly, HDFC Bank and HDFC after rallying big way through November, yeah. also kind of cooled off a bit. So. A state of flux, really, for the private banking space. In fact, it'll be good to get an idea, a sense of what to do with these two big boys, HDFC and HDFC Limited, and whether or not these are the bets that you need to have in your portfolio. Uh, Vineet, so for HDFC Limited and HDFC Bank, November was a particularly good month. Uh, you saw uh, a good contribution to the index as well from these heavyweights. But, uh, you know, currently, once they've already made their up move, are they still good bets to have in your portfolio? Uh, we are extremely positive on HDFC Bank. Okay, uh, we believe that the stock could, in a good market rally, to around 2400 to 2700. It's a broad range, but uh, very uh, positive on that. It's a top pick in the sector. 
And in terms of HDFC Limited, what we believe is that uh, uh, if there is one company which can, whether this uh, NBFC route is going to be HDFC Bank, because they have got deep pockets and uh, their, their portfolio has not been that much under strain. So, barring for you know the growth coming down, they could gain significantly in terms of uh, market share. And uh, in a bad market also, it would be a bellwether to hold uh, and a good hiding place to participate in the uh, uh, housing growth story of the country. So, we are quite positive on both the stocks. Okay. Um, the other uh, set of stocks, Vineet, and wonder what your view is out there. Sun Pharma and Sun Pharma Advanced Research. What does somebody do who's looking at the price, has fallen quite a bit, and sees perceived value here? Would you advise that? So the first uh, principle that I have been following uh, uh, over the last uh, few months, rather made it my first principle, is wherever you have corporate governance, get out. You know, because you don't know what will happen and how stocks will shape up, how long they will, the valuations will remain depressed. So while the business is good, uh, there's too much of corporate governance issues around that. Management has not been very transparent with regards to the advances given out. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, one should stay away from such stocks. And uh, India is a growth story. There are, it's a big universe and, you know, uh, no love, love lost out here. Mm. Rahul, anything other than Sun Pharma within the large cap pharma space that looks attractive right now? I think I think I would still wait in a pharma pack as a whole. So I think what I believe is I think domestic play looks good, but I think obviously valuation is a concern over there in a lot of play. So yes, uh, there's other opportunity if you want to go rather than pharma in uh, other sectors. So I think uh, I would avoid as of now in pharma as a whole. All right, so not liking pharma at this point in time. Remember, yesterday uh, and in the last one or two days, you've seen uh, uh, meaningful depreciation in the currency, but that is not reflected in the positive um, pricing move for some of the IT names as well as pharma names, which was the case uh, at the time uh, that we saw the initial downtick of the currency, but that didn't happen in yesterday's session. Uh, other than that, uh, within the IT pack, uh, Manav, come to you. Some of the mid-cap IT names right now, would there be a trading play in the likes of an NIT Tech, a Hexaware, an Emphasis? Uh, see, the, the IT pack has actually seen a good move already from its recent lows, uh, specifically when we talk about and IT tech, you know, the stock has been trying to form some sort of a base around the 200 EMA, but has not managed to see a uh, close above 1135, 1140 level. So, you know, unless we don't close above those levels, uh, I don't see any sort of a move, at least in an IT tech uh, for the near term. Uh, Hexaware, on the other side, you know, faces stiff resistance of its falling uh, gap pattern and has actually retraced from the resistance levels of 335. Um, I sense uh, for the near term, uh, you know, there are stocks which are facing some important resistance level. I think uh, one will see some sort of a pause in the near term, a uh, strong uh, base building and eventually then the breakout would happen. So I think for the near term, one can just keep an eye, look for some buying uh, near the support levels and not uh, at the current levels. Mm. Okay, um, this morning Chris Wood has uh, put out uh, a note and they are saying that uh, they've removed the India Bulls stocks from the model portfolio. So um, they've said that, or he said that investments in India Bulls Ventures and India Bulls Housing Finance will be removed from the Asia X Japan long only portfolio and the investment in Bajaj Finance will be increased by one percentage points. Now, that's interesting. Um, your global investors and global advisors are also kind of trying to separate. Um, X from Y, the wheat from the chaff, if I can use that term. Vineet Bolinchkar, uh, would you do that too? If you had investments in NBFCs which have had some pain and don't quite know the certainty of their performance versus a name like a Bajaj Finance or some of the others, would you advise a switch? Uh, definitely. As I told you earlier also that corporate governance plays number one role now because, you know, preservation of capital is foremost in these kind of bear markets. Uh, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, one should be out of uh, sectors where there is even the slightest hint of corporate governance. And if you look at the price action of all these stocks which have fallen down, if you talk of DHFL or even uh, Yes Bank and uh, uh, the India Bulls Group, what follows is that the price recovery is not that uh, meaningful. 
So if there was no nothing to worry about, we would have seen some kind of strong bounce back because the valuations are you know extremely attractive with the growth story that is uh, there in the hindsight. So I believe that you know corporate governance plays a paramount role in uh, stock picking now, and uh, no love lost out here again. Hmm. All right. A quick call, a trading call on uh, REC PFC Rahul. I think. <clears throat> I think both looks uh, interesting uh, from this play. So my sense is uh, we've seen this uh, uh, play, uh, both the stocks are doing quite well from the near, near term low. So I think nothing to lose in terms of um, um, uh, from the this levels of prices, what they're quoting at. So I think both looks interesting buying at this levels. All right. Uh, got that. Uh, we've got about 40 seconds left to go for market uh, pre-open and this morning we most likely headed northwards at least at pre-open and what the SGX is suggesting at this point. So 10,682 on SGX Nifty. The rest of the Asian market back seems to be extremely flat and nothing much happening but slight positive bias that's coming in. Extremely catatonic for Nikkei 2 to 5, Shanghai, and Hang Seng too, not doing much, pretty directionless. SGX Nifty thereabouts, half an hour percent higher, come off uh, marginally from the last time we took a check. 10,682 thereabouts where we are at. We're gonna be seeing how HCL Tech first up opens up and pre-open, but that's the indices for you. Uh, quarter of a percent given up on the Nifty and the Sensex opens 36,000. But uh, these are prices which are all over the place. You're going to be watching out carefully. Um, wait for a few more minutes till these prices cool off. HCL Tech is open negative uh, by about one and a half four percent right now. So not too much of a uh, of a change on pricing with the announcement of this deal. I believe probably it's uh, uh, the quantum of 1.8 million and how they're likely to pay for it. Um, that probably has some of the investors on the edge. Stock at 1,005, but the stock has run up in the last few trading sessions nonetheless. Z is down 1.7%, Hero Motor Corp is down 7 tons of percent, Bharti Infratel, Tata Motors is down half a percent, Gale is down a quarter, Power Grid, ICICI Bank are some of the other names. HCL Tech now cools off, so about a quarter of a percent under. M&M, that's showing you an uptick, initial uptick at least of about 10 odd percent, but don't go by that number. Hindalco is up about 3.5%, Wipro 2.5% higher. Uh, you've got an IOC 2.5%, Asian Paints 2.5%, HPCL Sun Pharma at 426 now from levels of 414 odd. So that's made uh, uh, some progress. And uh, Titan, LNT, LNT now once again approaching 1400. ITC at 275. And SBI moves up about a percent right now. So, all in all, flavors, it still seems more positive, half an odd percent higher on the index. The currency strengthened a bit, should pull up uh, on your screen 70.5638. So, quite a bit of strength out there, to be honest. Uh, maybe the crude fall, maybe the dollar uh, strength not lasting. The bond yield should come up on your screen as well. And after that big move that happened on the policy day, well, 7.40 for the for the bond yields. This is remarkable what's happened in the spate of what a month and a half or thereabouts. However, let's talk about specific pockets of strength or weakness. Some stocks in news. PFC RDC should come up on your screen and let's see if there's further weakness in PFC after what's happened all through the days. Early days as yet, I don't quite know if there'll be a 10% downtick, so let's reserve our thoughts. REC should come up on your screen and let's see what's happening there. Maybe sh nothing should happen there, uh, but uh, it becomes a subsidiary of PFC, so PFC is the one which obviously gets impacted. What's happening to other stocks? I, I doubt that an M&M Financial will have an 8% uptick. For now, it is showing that. What's not doing well, yield-wise? Well, interestingly, a slam dunk of 10%, uh, 9%. Initial days again, so just let's wait and watch. Magma FinCorp 5.5% lower. Uh, Muthut Finance, which had uh, an intraday fall of 10%, closed on closing basis about 5% lower, uh, should come up on your screen. And the management, of course, speaks to us at about 9.40, 9.45 today, but the stock looks like starting off marginally in the green. Rates all over the place, we'll try and dissect them in a bit. For now, let's just get back to our guests. Uh, yeah, in fact, I needed hmm. Muthut Finance for one. It took a slam dunk of 10% in intraday trade, but if you saw the close yesterday, complete recovery and in fact the stock closed in the green 
by the end of the trading session and just following through in today's trade. Yeah, so it should be interesting to hear out what the management has to say today. As I said, about 9.40, 9.45, you'll hear the management come and talk to us as well. But the markets, 10, 6, 4, 3, 42 points on open. A lot of people tune in right now and would want to know what to do with, uh, you know, the larger positions. Uh, Rahul, I'll come to you because I'd asked this question to Manav earlier. What's been this conversation this morning in the, in the, in the morning meet? Should the markets open marginally higher as they are looking to? And the fact that we have exit polls coming up later on in the day. If you were short, would you cover your shorts on open itself? <clears throat> I think the... Uh, 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 what you've seen is last two days good sell-off so obviously we would not advise to go remain short and obviously cut the position at this point juncture so my sense is i think one should cut the positions at this point of time and interestingly if you see notice yesterday that i think the heavyweights on the nifty front have been you know managing itself it's just down one two percent from the recent high so my sense is I think one should cut the short position at, at least in Nifty front and interestingly what I discussed in Bank Nifty if, if you see that the levels of 26200 has been maintained so it's just an, the fall to, to 400 points from the recent uh, high so my sense I think one should cut the short at this juncture. Mm. What about an HPBP IOC Manav? Uh, see, uh, uh, if you're looking at the charts for the OMCs, you know, after a recent rise, they have actually been forming a sideways consolidation. But PPCL definitely looks uh, one of the best in the lots. You know, the prices, after a good move, has been trying to consolidate, uh, having support at 320 on the low side and the upward resistance at 340. You know, given a choice, I would just want to take a short term bet of only two to three days trading session since the prices are at the mentioned support levels and for a bounce towards 340 so a stop of 318 can be placed and this is a stop loss which is also below the gap pattern so overall it's a good uh, trade that one can initiate uh, hpcl looks weak even I ioc is looking weak comparatively at the current stand so there could also be an option of a pair trade where you could also go long bpcl and short hpcl Vineet, uh, just come in on uh, you know the metal space and particularly steel, which have seen a, a, a definitive uh, a cut in prices over the recent past few weeks. Be it on the back of uh, demand, China demand, be it on the back of uh, increase in raw material prices, the pressures are building up steadily for most of these companies. Yeah, so so you know, I believe that the uh, the stocks are beaten down, prices have come down, and uh, typically, you know, December is the month when things start moving around. Today, China has said that they are acting very uh, quickly and uh, uh, hastily on uh, not hastily, rather in earnestness with the their part of the deal to you know not to scuttle the trade with the U.S. So if, uh, you know, China plays a very compelling role in uh, satisfying their part of the bargain, I believe that the Americans would be forced to, uh, you know, call off the trade uh, barriers of sorts. And this could be a great moment to accumulate uh, steel stocks, given the fact that, you know, uh, even the U.S. is going to go in for a infrastructure-led uh, growth because their infrastructure is really, uh, you know, uh, in bad shape. So globally, we've seen uh, uh, infra being a strong play, and I believe that from these levels, you know, as a contra play, steel could be a a good uh, point to start nibbling at over the long term. Do you go in for sale, Vinit? That's been a favorite for you from a, from some time now. And now, if if at all the fundamentals haven't changed, then the valuations are only a lot more reasonable than what they were. Yes, so that's where we come from. We believe that uh, sale, you know, pricing is not in a control. It's a global dynamic. But, you know, we've got enough headroom for uh, volume growth to take place. They've added capacities very aggressively over the last few years. Capacities have been done with without much, uh, you know, garnering of debt as the other two leading players have got huge debt mounts. And uh, I believe that if there is a, a, a good uh, outlook for steel prices, then you know we could uh, we are sitting on a, a juicy valuations as of as we speak hmm. the other one would be a jet airways the stock in the last one month has moved up about 10 odd percent no detrimentally negative news but just that now they're looking for a soft loan from etihad they've asked for i think about 
uh, $300 million. They're mm -hmm. getting closer to about a $150 million mm -hmm. soft loan from Etihad. Uh, what would you do with this stock? Uh, or would you even uh, consider it uh, to be an addition in uh, the portfolio of Enik? So it would be more of a trade, you know. As I said, corporate governance is uh, prima facie my principle now. Uh, and uh, if at all one were to trade, this one would be purely, uh, you know, a very short term move. Since they've got these, if they get these loans, they would be able to make good their payments. And uh, uh, Jet Airways is a very volatile stock. So, you know, moves are uh, very accented both on the upside and the downside. And since we've got a lot of tailwinds and, uh, you know, the ATF prices are the one of the key drivers of this, uh, uh, of the, you know, airline industry, uh, this could be a calculated trade for me on the upside. Okay, since you mentioned this could possibly be a trade, let's ask Manav. Manav, do you, do you see uh, a, a significant potential in the stock to, if you have to go uh, take a trade on it? See, at the current levels, uh, you know, I sense there is an important support at 270 and the way the stock has breached its recent support, there is a high chance that the prices would break lower and eventually again retest the lows of 235, which is its weekly support levels. Uh, given a choice, you know, the kind, uh, the, the, the decline in crude, you know, that could be only one trade whereby uh, you could see a short-term spurt coming into uh, jet, but, you know, overall trend uh, for the stock has been quite weak. Uh, you know, and uh, instead of going long, uh, uh, I would still sense if the prices break 270 levels, I would uh, want to go short into this rather than going long. Okay. Stay on, Jamin. Minutes away from market open. Let's tell you all that you need to know to stay ahead in trade today. HCL Tech will buy select IBM software products for $1.8 billion. The transaction is expected to close by mid-2019. IBM wants to focus on cloud computing, while HCL Tech expects $650 million per annum from the acquisition. That's the second year onwards. The PFC REC deal is approved, says Finance Minister Arun Jaitley. The cabinet has given its nod for the sale of 52.63% stake in REC to PFC along with management control. That's not all. There is another plan to tap the public sector firms to plug the fiscal gap. NTPC may acquire central government stake in SJVN, according to a PTI report. But joint venture partner Himachal Pradesh government is saying no. Discussions are going on. Let's move on to bulk deals then. Wash International has bought 0.65% stake in Kajaria Ceramics. Abu Dhabi Investment Authority was the seller. And there are some key brokerage calls for you. City has downgraded Indian steel stocks on falling steel prices, rising leverage and valuations. And lastly, Jet Airways has sought a soft loan of $350 million from investment partner Etihad. Jet also is in talks with the Gulf carrier to offload an additional stake, according to PTI reports. Well, let's wait and watch what happens here. Um, we need, before we thank you, uh, if somebody wants to invest fresh money into the markets right now, or by right now, I mean, say, maybe even Wednesday, if not like today, today, what is uh, an idea that people can consider? So there is one uh, uh, idea which has uh, uh, got a lot of institutional interest, that is G shipping. You know, some 14, 15 funds have met them off recently. And... Uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, things happening in the shipping industry. One is uh, uh, which are very disruptive. And generally, generally when there has been uh, bad news or disruption, uh, it has always benefited, uh, you know, the, the prices of uh, the prices of the travel. So, uh, considering that, I believe that you know we are going to get into an environment where you have to do capex to, uh, you know, use low sulfur diesel and uh, ballast water treatment plants are a compulsion. So given these two kind of uh, uh, things coming in and uh, headwinds coming in and you know, the prices have rebounded close to 30% of their lows. Uh, I believe the freight rates, I believe that, uh, you know, G shipping with their low debt, their ability to buy in deep in the cycle and sell their vessels and uh, with uh, the freights going up, I think uh, there is space for good money to be made both in the short term and over the next one year outlook.
All right, we leave it at that, Vineet. Thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking out the time. Vineet Bulunjkar there with his fundamental calls. Some of the other names to watch out for and that have done particularly well in the last seven days of trade has been in Oberoi Realty. The stock has moved up about 15% in the last seven days. Along with that, a jubilant life at 803 has traded up 15% this last week. Uh, would you trade any of these names, Manav? Uh, see, looking at the charts for Obroy, definitely, uh, you know, the prices have seen a very good breakout on the weekly charts and is on the verge of seeing a breakout on the monthly. Uh, any short-term pullback towards the support of 460 on the daily basis would be an additional uh, margin of safety uh, for the stock for initiating long positions. And, you know, the prices have seen a very good impulsive rally. I sense, you know, the prices are showing that kind of a move whereby it could eventually go and test its highs of 550, 600. So it's, overall, this is going to be a buy on dips approach. And you know, in case of any market hiccups in the near term, this stock should be added on the lower levels. And uh, eventually, one can still expect an upside of 15, 20% in at least six months time horizon. All right, quick uh, uh, top calls as we open up for trade this morning. Uh, what about you, Rahul? Let's start off with that. I think I would continue with Infi uh, uh, as I discussed earlier. So I would go long on Infosys with a stop loss of 655 and target of 690. Manav? See, at the short-term perspective, Siemens looks good. You know, the volume built-up has been very good in the last couple of trading sessions. So a stop of uh, 915 can be placed for a fresh uh, long position for an upside target of 965. Okay. Manav, Rahul, request you to stay on. We'll just take in one opening thought from you post-market open and then let you go. But half a percent seems to be the start that we'll have. The market's about to start trading. So we'll start off in the green. The question mark only is, will we build on from there? Um, important day of trade because the last day before the exit polls uh, come in. But this is how we started off, about half a percent higher for the Sensex and the Nifty. Uh, maybe not the Nifty, but almost there. The Nifty Bank about half a percent too. So not a bad start really for our markets. The mid caps and the small caps should come up on your screen next. You'll probably see a fair bit of green out there too. At least the mid caps have half a percent green. The small caps about a quarter of a percent. So not a bad start for our markets. Uh, bring up the heat map and let's see what's moving and what's not. I presume the oil marketing companies would be perched right up here. And and yes, they are. IOC, BP, and HPCL, no brainer, frankly, with group prices coming off. So I think all these three stocks have started off well. Yes, Bank has some gains to itself, about a percent, percent and a half. And some commodity names come off, come up, get into the green. So Hindalco, for example, is up about a percent, percent and a quarter. No notable moves on the index, but a fair degree of green on the screen. And not enough red, mind you. So HCL Tech, about a couple of percentage points lower. I think the street might be worried only with the quantum of the deal, but net net seems positive. Uh, so let's wait and watch if this gets bought into. Gale about a percent lower. TCS, Wipro, Tata Motors, well, marginally in the red. So only only two notable pockets on the index, at least HCL Tech on the downside, now about 3%, and all marketing companies on the upside, all three of them trading marginally in the green. I presume Asian Paints should be somewhere in the list of gainers too. <clears throat> Anyways, just a couple of pockets that I want to highlight before I hand it over to Devina for what's happening across the broader end of the spectrum. Firstly, the deal done for PFC RDC, and let's see what's the impact thereof. PFC down about 4%. RDC, you didn't anyways expect too much of an impact. It's the it's the company they're getting acquired and not shelling out the money. That's okay. PFC down about 4% or 3.5%. What about stocks which are trading very close to 52-week lows or at 52-week lows yesterday? All of them have bounced back, especially Quest Corp. Um, but uh, let's see if this bounce back lasts or does it fizzle away. As we speak, the Nifty 50 now just about a third of a percent in the green. Devina, what are you spotting? Well, we start off with uh, Muthut Finance after yesterday's uh, plunge post results and recovery. Uh, the stock today is up about three odd percent, three, three and a half odd percent right now. Uh, Yuko Bank, a smaller bank there, 18 odd rupees on the c counter, but it's doing okay for itself. Uh, Jed Airways is up three percent, so about 286 on the counter. Manapuram Finance follows Muthut and that's two up about three percent. You have a JSW Energy that's doing okay. Avanti Feeds two and a quarter percent higher. Unitech has moved up as well uh, in the session about uh, two two and a quarter of a percent higher. VIP Industries moves up in the session this morning, and then you've got the likes of a Coolgate, Palmolive, Oberoi Realty. So some real estate stocks are doing okay. Even in Devils Real Estate is up in trade this morning. Interglobe Aviation following suit with Jet Airways is the one that's doing okay right now. 
amongst uh, some of the losers you've got uh, lower circuit for 8k miles remember this is a, a very difficult stock to trade so you have uh, days and days of upper circuit where there is a uh, no uh, level that you can buy into and then you have uh, the, the days of selling on lower circuit that comes in where there is a no the, where there is no opportunity to get out of the stock gale is down 1.86% uh, that one or two looking slightly weak this morning okay quick thoughts from our technical experts before we let them go man of opening thoughts anything any trade that pops up on your screen see at the current levels uh, 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 uh. hello neeraj is that for hello. me yes so, uh, uh, Manav, we're just having some problems okay. with your audio. Just Rahul, okay. opening thoughts from you. Anything that pops up on your screen? Anything that people should keep in mind? I think HP Shell looks good, uh, and for a trading purpose, that's what I feel. I think uh, post crude prices. So my sense, uh, risk reward ratio could be better, uh, better in HP Shell as well. So I think we could go long in HP Shell with a stop loss of 220 and target of 245. Rahul, we'll let you go on that note. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your time. Manav, quick thoughts. Anything that pops up on your screen? See, I had mentioned about Raymond, you know, so that looks weak. Uh, the the opening is also not good, and in, in fact, the prices are trading near its low. So I think initiate fresh shots into this. The stop loss that I have mentioned is 785, and the lower target 730. Got that, Manav. We leave it at that. Thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate you taking out the time. Another important market voice. Then we've got Sanjay Dutt, director at Quantum Securities. He's joining us on the show this morning. Sanjay, good morning to you. <clears throat> the setup right now, uh, considering what we had about three Morning. months ago, has uh, really turned in our favor. Be it on the backdrop of the crude oil prices, be it on the backdrop of the currency strengthening a bit more. Uh, a lot has changed, and even uh, the global market setup right now, uh, probably in favor where you have some money coming into emerging markets. What's the sense like right now, and whether or not the volatility that's built around the elections is something that takes precedence over a better market setup to enter into right now? I think in the immediate uh, uh, short term, that's today and Monday, until the results come out. Obviously, it's the election overhang that we are living with. But uh, um, in my view, uh, negatives from the elections are more or less in the price. Uh, market participants are fearing that uh, you know BJP would leave, lose all the three states. So even if we do have a negative results, I think uh, that is means all three states are lost. We'll probably see a panic, hundred uh, hundred fifty points uh, fall on the Nifty, and then things f come back to the fundamentals ahead. And you correctly pointed out that uh, you know the macros have started to look a little better, uh, both uh, from uh, within India as well as outside India. And uh, what is most important is that we've had a reasonably, uh, very uh, reasonably good correction over the last eight to ten months. Uh, valuations have become fairly reasonable right now. Yesterday we saw the last bastion following that, uh, following that's the Kotak Mahindra's and the you know, large cap stocks falling three to five percent. So we are pretty well positioned now as fundamental investors to start uh, shopping. Interesting, Sanjay. Good morning, Neeraj here, and thanks so much for joining. And I presume this is the first time we are talking on the platform. So good having you. Morning. Um, would you presume that uh, the the shopping Thank should you. be done at a at, at at a pace which is uh, more staggered, or would you presume that it's good to actually uh, put in uh, a bulk of your money into companies where the valuations look a lot more attractive? Because frankly, the broader market is has seen quite a bit of pain in this 300 point fall that we've seen on the Nifty. I think it's all got to be uh, bottom up. Uh, if you've seen uh, stocks where you have conviction, you've done your research, and you've seen they've fallen much below the level that you expected, or are the level that you expected them to to buy them. Uh, the compelling valuations, given the uh, growth outlook ahead in 2019-20, uh, then you should absolutely go ahead and buy them. But wherever you see, I think there is a scope for correction. Then you could probably use a staggered approach because they may not actually reach your targeted prices in the sense the prices that you've got in mind or the fair valuations you think you need to buy them. Then you can probably have a staggered approach because everything doesn't actually you know correct to the level that you wanted to correct or comes to a, 
attractive valuation or fair valuation, you need to take a call. So there you could have a staggered approach. But wherever you see they've reached your levels, uh, you should just go ahead and buy them. Don't worry about the last 5 or 10% panic that might happen because of some other factors. Sanjay, I remember a couple of years ago uh, on a Diwali day, we had laid a bet about what would do well over the ensuing 12 months, mid caps or small caps or large caps. I must say I'm saying this out right now because I had won that bet against you. My question to you is from here on for the next uh, 9 to 12 odd months, what do you think uh, will find or give you bigger bang for the buck? Would you be sanguine towards the broader end of the spectrum or would you stick to the safety of the large caps currently? Well, acknowledging the fact that I lost the bet, uh, you know, uh, coming to your question, I think uh, I would stick to the mid caps because it's all a function of your risk reward profile. Uh, a person like me likes to look for, look for much higher returns. Uh, I'm not happy with the 15, 20% per annum. I'm probably looking at 15 to 100% or 2x, 3x kind of returns. So those kind of returns normally come in mid and small caps. And I think uh, that's where I would take my calls at this point of time. But like I said, it's primarily a function of your risk reward. If you're not willing to really take the higher risk, uh, stick to the safety of large caps, which will give you a good return, which will definitely, uh, it's a good time to buy them also because they've corrected now and uh, start nibbling into them. But I think some of the mid caps have definitely reached uh, compelling valuations now and those can be probably bought in much larger quantities uh, that you allocated money for. Mm. <coughs> So Sanjay, keeping risk reward in mind, if uh, you know you have to take a call on specific sectors where the probability of you making more money is still there if the turnaround happens in, in a meaningful fashion. I mean, if you take a look at valuations for most of the NBFCs, they've corrected significantly. Is that going to be a, a pocket of interest uh, on a risk reward parameter versus uh, you know some of uh, uh, the names like uh, an HUL and the other defensive lot where they're safer names to be in, but uh, the additional kicker or the extent of gains may not be as large. I agree with you that, uh, you know, if you're willing to take that extra risk, it may be a good time to add uh, some of the beaten down NBFCs which have been aggressively sold over the last few months because that's one sector that will has to contribute to the growth of the economy and that will provide uh, financing to the system. And it's been clearly acknowledged by Reserve Bank of India also that it's there to support that uh, sector of financing. Uh, so I think uh, the good NBFCs, uh, which have corrected aggressively, particularly in the mortgage business, uh, they have a huge market ahead. So there I think it's a no-brainer that you need to start uh, buying into some of them right now. They will definitely give you good returns and some of them are very liquid also. So therefore, you can, you can exit them without any problem in case uh, your stop loss levels are reached. Uh, but that, but, it, but, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to have some of the consumption plays that you mentioned, Hindustan levers and those. You would have them there. Uh, you may have a lesser allocation if your risk profile is much uh, greater than uh, most of the common small investors is. So currently, uh, Sanjay, if one is looking to churn their portfolios, what should make an exit and what should make an entry? See, I think uh, entry definitely. I can, uh, I can, uh, I can suggest some ideas. Uh, exit is clearly a function of where you are comfortable right now and what you think you have answers for. Even if they fall in 50%, but you have conviction, just hold on to them because we've seen historically in markets like India and most emerging markets, and even now you've seen in developed markets that mid cap, small cap, even large caps correct 40 to 50%, and then even go back up. Uh, if you have conviction of them and you know what the stories are correct. So leaving that selling part aside, that's it, call one needs to take looking at one's portfolio. On the buying side, I think uh, this is a good time to keep accumulating uh, good cement stocks, insurance companies, some asset management companies. Insurance is one space I think there's huge potential ahead in India. Uh, so therefore, those stocks you must add to your portfolio. The top, top insurance that are listed right now, uh, they're a definite buy at this point of time. Cement, I obviously mentioned, that's another place to be. I think that's a very big secular story in India. So my primary focus would be these. 
yes uh, some of good quality infrastructure plays will continue to make make money uh, one of the best plays that come into my mind for a stable long term portfolio is reliance industries i think that's go to deliver huge value over the next 2 uh, to 3 years to investors as uh, unlocking of various uh, companies may take place or businesses may take place probably so there is a huge basket to look at right now nbfc we spoke about good mortgage companies that's again a huge market in india even if we had a real estate slowdown at this point of time uh, i think that excess inventory is going to correct and once again mortgage company will be back in business and this time in fact the quality of lending will be way better for them so uh, that's a fairly large uh, area that i have uh, suggested four five areas where one can invest for the next 2 uh, to 3 years Certainly. By the way, a couple of stocks that I want to mention before I take my final question to Sanjay Dutt. HCL Tech is down about four percent on their acquisition uh, and the large one at that. And Gail on that CLSA downgrade is looking like starting off or has started off about three and a half percent lower. So do watch out for both of these large cap names. Um, Sanjay Dutt, uh, you made uh, a, a few years earlier, I presume, a contrarian call on real estate in in specific pockets, and it paid re- rich dividends to you. do you reckon this is a time when somebody can take a contrarian call on real estate because it's going through a state of flux that it hasn't seen in the last few years now i don't think so you know uh, neeraj because uh, there is still time you know the excess inventory uh, you know the problems of balance sheets uh, they are still plaguing these companies uh they they would take a little more time to really you know kind of uh, sort those out but yes uh, some of the good names uh, like a dlf etc you you can have in your portfolio safely uh, if you need to have some exposure to real estate but i think uh, out from uh, out performance or you know market beating returns i don't think they'll be there in the sector anymore you would get uh, you know normal returns or slightly out performance in select stocks Yes, but uh, you know, gone are the days where you could probably bet on something that will give you fifty to hundred percent compounding over the next uh, five ten years, as it happened in the early two thousand and mid two thousands. So that's not the place to be if you want those kind of returns. Stable, steady returns. You could probably bet on a DLF. Um, and just for my want of trying to understand, if you are playing contrary on some of the stressed assets, either infrastructure or power, which kind of is a subset of infrastructure. Uh, do you reckon that uh, we are close to the end of the pain and if it is worth uh, doing cherry picking out there or there are better spaces to invest into uh i'm taking a contrary and play right now in uh, psu banking uh, because i'm of i'm of the uh, clear thinking and you know after doing a lot of work that the likes of state bank canara bank bank of baroda some of the larger banks you know uh, cannot stay behind if we expect a kodak bank or a hdfc bank to actually eat up the entire uh, market and these psu banks would be left with say 10 or 20% or 30% of the entire banking space i don't think so so my contrarian bet would be on these uh, you know three four good quality psu banks where more or less everything is provided for uh, they're trading at compelling valuations some of them are just about uh, you know Two, three billion dollars or four billion dollars market cap, price to book below one probably. You know, like a Canara or a BOB or a you know, a PNB. So I would take a contrary and bet there. I think there's money to be made there because the cleanup that's happened, and more important to me, that quality of lending that will happen going ahead because of the events of the last two, three years that we've seen. You know, stricter lending norms, RBA supervision, governance now being. Uh, the you know primary issue that's going to drive lending in these banks no more reckless lending is going to happen for a long time to come so i think they are a good play and you really can't have a banking universe without these three four large uh, public sector banks okay so uh, looking good to invest in some of these psu banks and the large names there like sbi sanjay uh, Do you like commodity as a play? I mean, you, while you spoke about cement uh, as a pocket that you're liking right now, but uh, you know, take an example of oil and gas, or take an example of metals as a pocket. Uh, does that uh, warrant a look? 
In oil and gas, I obviously mentioned the best play that's there in the country, the largest play right now in the private sector, that's Reliance, uh, where I think uh, it's a no-brainer, you must have it in your portfolio. Of course, timing at 5-10% higher, lower is a month's game. But uh, that's something that you should definitely have in your portfolio. Uh, other areas, I don't think uh, there's anything that's uh, that compelling to really have in one's uh, portfolio, you know, other than uh, probably Reliance. Because I can't really understand, you know, ONGC, HPCL, BPCL, because you still don't know what oil pricing, etc. is going to be. That, that always plagues them every 6-12 months, so you can't get your timing right in them. Okay. Sanjay, that on that note, we'll leave it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us. Uh, it's a pleasure having you on Bloomberg Quint. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you, Divina. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. Yeah. That's an important market voice. Sanjay Dutt uh, loves to play contrarian and gets it right a number of times. So some pockets, some stocks that we've discussed, uh, you can log on to this uh, discussion again on this feed and try and hear that if you missed it. Uh, let's take a break. You don't want to miss the conversations coming up on the other side, though. Federal Bank, um, interesting last four or five odd quarters. We discussed the asset quality picture with managing director Sham Srinivasan. He joins us up next and then decode the September quarter earnings for Muthut Finance with managing director George Alexander Muthut. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint Live. B. Sanjeev Goenka Group, Growing Legacies. Celebrating 100 years of smile, services, assurance, excellence, commitment. Building beneficial relations with customers and stakeholders. Union Bank of India celebrates 100 years. Thank you for your support. <laughs> The final state assembly elections before 2019, five states and three BJP bastions. Even if politics isn't front and center for you, this is the one you can't miss. Will Prime Minister Modi regain momentum after the string of bipolar losses and the disappointment in Karnataka? Will BJP hold its 2014 sweep across Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh or stumble? Will regional leaders like Rahul Gandhi take the lead next year? Can the party's relentless march into the northeast take down the last frontier of Mizoram? Will the move to call early elections in Telangana Pay off or backfire for Chief Minister Chandrasekhar Rao. We're going to geek out on all the numbers and monitor each swing. And find you the tiny shifts which could change fortunes. Watch us crunch those numbers, sift through all of that data. To tell you why this election is so important. So do join us on 11th of December, only on Bloomberg Quint.
back with Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint. Let's shift focus to corporates. Federal Bank is the first one. They've had a number of issues to contend with. Kerala floods leading to additional slippages in quarter two, which uh, well may rise in quarter three and quarter four. Um, but as per the management, and then came RNFS and the bank has exposure of 200 crores to these three RNFS projects. Now comes the RBI with its new lending rate framework, which bankers say may cause short-term disruptions as well. So what's the plan now at Federal Bank? Let's put that question to the MD and CEO, Shyam Srinivasan. He joins us right now on the show. Mr. Srinivasan, good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. Um, you know, first off the bat, we've, of course, spoken to bankers yesterday as well. But this whole uh, benchmarking and what it would do two loan portfolios because I think uh, for, for a lot of uh, commercial vehicle or auto loan portfolios, the probably rates might be fixed as compared to home loans. But in home loans with a longer or larger tenure, etc., there might be uh, a variance in the way banks have given out loans until now and will have to give post April. Yeah, uh, morning, uh, Niraj. Yes, this uh, development is uh, quite fresh, but uh, I think the banks will have to readjust to a new reality. Uh, floating rate deposits is obviously an option, but the market for that is, a, is not established. B, we don't know how deep it is. So one has to figure it out. Uh, having said that, as you pointed out, this will largely apply to assets in the, in the home loan space. The big question being, these are very long-term assets. So one has to figure out how this is going to happen. It may have some near-term uh, system-wide implications, but there have been many such challenges which have uh, sort of handsomely overcome. Point would be uh, which external benchmark and what is the spread about that. As long as there is some sanity in the spread, then it's an addressable issue. But if an, an institution and if they're a leading player start playing with the spread, then it'll have a market-wide implication. So I'm making no judgment. Uh, we just have to wait and see how things play out. Uh, but it's a development uh, which is quite different from anything that's happened in the near past. Yeah, let's see if, if the retail investors are a lot more happier than bankers, Mr. Srinivasan. But yeah, I think it, it's difficult to gauge as to what the impact would be right now. Let's talk about Federal Bank then. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk post quarter two, but if I just look at uh, what's happened, there's a bit of a dichotomy in, in the way I uh, perceive things, Mr. Srinivasan. Um, your guidance of 1400 to 1500 crore slippage probably implies a lower slippage ratio, despite the fact that I thought that the, in, in some conversations, uh, the message came out that slippages could actually uh, get exaggerated in quarter three and quarter four. How do you think the picture would look? You would have had some sense of how quarter three would look like because, well, two months have already passed by. Uh, like I've been mentioning, uh, we are not changing our overall guidance. We are very much in that range. Uh, beyond that, I have really no incremental comment to offer than what I said in August almost immediately after the floods and at the end of our uh, Q2 results, the commentary we shared. I think we are uh, trending along those lines. We still believe that 1450, 1500 overall slippages is very much within the uh, ambit of how we are progressing this financial year. So, okay, I'm not looking for an additional comment, but just wondering if, if that's the number that we are working with Mr. Srinivasan, then the slippages ratio should probably look a bit better than what the street might be working with right now. Uh, my inputs remain the same, Niraj. I'm uh, okay. refusing to make any incremental input on this. Fair call. Uh, just, just wondering if things have stabilized a lot more post the Kerala floods, uh, now that there is some time and some time for recovery that would have come in as well. One, for the business sentiment out there because you would be a barometer. And two, for the lending community which caters to that market. So I think the... Uh, a uh, key point which we mentioned, uh, rather mentioning all through, not only federal, most of the lenders would agree. The client sentiment behavior on the borrowing and repayment side, for most customers who have some commercial uh, or salary, they haven't been tremendously dam damaged. Having said that, the life and livelihood of people who live along the uh, path of the where the water was maximum, those people have had to readjust to a different life and are trying to come to terms with it. But that tends to be typically less the bank uh, customer who's taken big loans. They are a more livelihood in the area of farming and other day-to-day -day, uh, uh, wage earners. So to that extent, the impact on banking per se has been, or I would think most of us would say the same thing, more or less dimensioned and playing to that script. 
Uh, having said that, are the restoration work in those areas, are people coming back to life? A lot of work is uh, going on, but I guess there's lots more to be done. And we as a good corporate citizen are doing our parts in every part because some of that is in and around where we live and work. So we have taken up those communities for help. So it's a two-part answer. The commercial and business conduct, I would say, is more or less in, on track. Uh, except for certain pockets. The physically uh, impacted people who have lost lives and livelihood, there's a, a lot of effort, but I think that has a different kind of social implication, less commercial implication. Okay. Um, well, one only hopes that both the social and the commercial uh, pictures improve more dramatically and more quickly than what uh, everybody would anticipate. One other big change that's happened, Mr. Srinivasan, uh, for almost all, everybody in the financial space has been the recent ILNFS issue and the NBFC crisis resulting along with. Now, it opens up uh, areas for banks which hitherto were completely dominated by or largely dominated by NBFCs. My question to you would be that would you benefit materially in the areas that you operate in because of some NBFCs going a bit slower because of constraints of capital? And two, if indeed those opportunities have risen already, uh, if you need funding, would you look to maybe issue more corporate deposits or otherwise in the near term in order to be able to fund that loan growth? Um, Neeraj, uh, you I recall you mentioning that for five, six quarters, our credit growth has been quite good. Uh, we continue to be on that stream. Uh, growth is strong. We don't want to pick growth that is uh, on the edge. Our ability to fund that growth is quite robust. Our CD ratios are in control. Our liquidity uh, opportunities are significant, as is capital. So I think for us, growth is not constrained uh, by liquidity. It's constrained, if at all, by the appetite we have. And we're quite selecting, uh, select, select, selective about where and what we grow. Uh, that said, the uh, recent opportunities that have come up on account of slowing down of some of the NBFCs has given us pickup on the retail side. But retail end customer moving to federal, uh, you know, the last two months have been quite spectacular for us in some of our geographies where we've seen good growth. And I think that will continue. But that's not a buyout of a portfolio. It's client moving for various reasons. And I'm happy that they're moving to us versus somebody else. So yes, there are growth opportunities. We're not constrained by either capital or appetite. Wherever it's good, we have started growing. We're seeing growth. And we are giving a conscious twist to the portfolio also to balance out between a, a, a you know, more corporate heavy to uh, even balancing between corporate and uh, retail. That's how our shift is. And you'll see it visible in the coming quarters. Okay. My, my final question. Um... Uh, Mr. Srinivasan, and that's uh, looking at what excites you the most. Now, you're obviously looking at a, uh, at, a, at a run rate of about 10 million customer mark very, very quickly, and you'll probably look to cross-sell a lot of your products there. You've beefed up your personal loan portfolio, if I'm not wrong, an analytics team to kind of look at that product too. What area or what vertical within a multiple few multiples that you're operating right now is showing the, base, is showing the best promise for growth uh, for the next three or four quarters? Uh, again, because of base effect, areas like personal loans and um, even auto loans, where our current base is very small, they are registering over 100% growth, which is great, but uh, on the balance, if I grow from 500 crores to 2,000 crores, it's still only 1,500 crores increase. Uh, it may look like 300% growth. On 105,000, 110,000 crores, it won't show up as a large number, but uh, areas like personal loans, auto loans, and commercial vehicles are turning out to be very attractive for us. These are new forays of the bank. Uh, while we continue to strengthen our mid-market and commercial banking businesses, which thankfully uh, we've introduced a lot of capabilities and talent. So we're seeing pickup across. But I'd like to see the overall weight of the book, which is currently 55-45 uh, wholesale retail, to get to 50-50 over the next two years, which means the points I mentioned, areas like personal loan, uh, areas like commercial vehicles, areas like auto, all that have to kick in at uh, a higher run rate so that the blend shifts 50-50. Okay, we wish you all the best for all of those as, as well as for the asset quality stability, uh, Mr. Srinivasan. Thanks so much for taking the time out. Look forward to talking to you post your quarter three numbers. Thank you, all the best. That's Sham Srinivasan of Federal Bank talking about
what the numbers could look like going ahead and of course the new loan benchmarking system as well from that to earnings that came out yesterday yeah Mosul finance and the stock in early morning trade seems to be doing okay for itself Kerala floods seem to have slowed recoveries for Mosul finance as its net interest income fell by 4.2% in September quarter. The positive was that gold financer witnessed its highest ever quarterly growth in gold loans. But asset quality concerns remain for the Kerala-based NBFC after the flood. So are bad loans on a rise? Let's find out from Managing Director George Alexander Muthut. Uh, Mr. Muthut, thanks very much for joining in and taking out the time to address your numbers with us as well as the growth trajectory uh, for you. Let's start off with the September quarter and uh, the historic high for gold loans that we've seen as well as uh, the uh, the overall picture for the quarter how has it been for you see the quarter has been good uh, we have seen good growth in the uh, just the gold loan portfolio as well as in the overall uh, loan portfolio we have reached 35,000 plus as far as the consolidated portfolio is concerned and as far as the standalone gold loan portfolio is concerned we have crossed the 32,000 crore mark also that has been a really historic and that's a good performance in this quarter right so let's talk a little bit more about uh, you know uh, the one-offs that we've seen and uh, because of delayed payments from customers you've seen an increase in interest income coming in specifically for a few quarters which spiked your yields to about 24 percent uh, are you expecting normalization of the yields back to 2021 levels going forward? Yeah, I think, I think we have normalized it to 2021 percent. That's what we see going forward also. The spike in yield uh, in the last quarter, last year, this quarter, uh, it has eased off. And now uh, going forward, we should be seeing the yield at 21 uh, percent, around the 21 percent range. I think it has uh, even uh, tapered off to that uh, constant level. So just to get an idea from you, uh, you know, for a lender like yourself, uh, there are two ways which, which you make money. If the underlying asset price increases, which for gold hasn't been happening because uh, it has remained fairly range bound in the recent past. And the other point is increasing your customer footprint meaningfully. Uh, what is the direction that you intend to take in order to make sure that the second happens? If at all the prices for gold don't give you that additional leg up. So first of all, I need to correct you with the sense that the price of the increase in price of gold uh, doesn't actually give us more profits. It only means uh, we can lend more to a single party. Other than that, uh, it doesn't give us any extra yield, or rather, our collateral which we have becomes a little more stronger if the gold price goes up. Other than that, on the yield, there is nothing we get because the interest, uh, the gold price goes up. Having said that, the second part of your question about customer footfalls. Actually, customer footfalls have started increasing. Our total customer base is also increasing. Uh, we have taken quite a lot of uh, steps towards marketing and sales, and uh, uh, I think that is showing good results. Uh, as of date, we have about uh, 2 lakh customers coming to our branches every day for transacting with us, either for getting a new loan, for closing their loan, or for interest payment. So that's a fall we have. And uh, I think that customer base is uh, certainly good for us. And it is uh, gradually increasing only. What is the plan for the subsidiary, sir, going forward? See, the main subsidiaries we have is the home loan subsidiary, uh, which has a portfolio of about 1,800 crores as of date. And also the microfinance, which has about 1,200 crores of portfolio. Uh, uh, so the third subsidiary is a Sri Lankan subsidiary, which is uh, very small. It's about uh, 1,100 crores of Sri Lankan rupee. To take half of that, maybe 500 crores of Indian rupees, the uh, loan book in that subsidiary. So these subsidiaries uh, certainly should grow. And today our subsidiaries constitute about 10% plus of our total portfolio. We wish to uh, bring it to 15% by the end of the year. Probably we'll reach around that 15% uh, uh, target by end of March as the subsidiaries grow. As far as the gold loan business is concerned, we would like to grow it by about 15% plus in this year, just the gold loan portfolio. All right. So let's talk about uh, the expectation regarding the asset quality figure going forward. What do you expect uh, to see in the, the consecutive quarters? Uh, see, the asset quality 
is has been absolutely impeccable. The quality of the assets we have, the gold which we have, which we have with us, which uh, on which we have lent 32,000 crores, is perfectly good. All the gold is good quality. Whatever is there which is stolen gold, etc., we have already written off as uh, loan losses. So what we have, the quality of the asset is good. It is only that we give more flexible time to the customer to repay his loan. Because of that, sometimes these crosses the uh, DPD rate, DPD date, and that is seen as a technical NP. So whatever NPS you see are not a loan loss at all. We have never lost even one rupee because of an NPA account. An NPA account is just a, a technical NPA. The, the gold is good, the customer is there, when we, uh, when we, when the customer releases the gold, we get the full money. If by chance, even after giving him some time, the customer does not come and take his gold, we auction it. Even when we auction it, we realize 100% of the principal. Probably, uh, if the interest is uh, 23 or 24, we may end up with 17, 18, or 19%. So we have never lost anything. Again, finally, even the technical NPS in this quarter has come down. From 4% plus, it has come down to 1% plus in this quarter. Oh, it's 1.9%. Of course, it's irrelevant for a gold finance company. But having said that, uh, NPS is something which people look at it. So ours is 1.6. And that is also because we had a six-month scheme last year, which has now run down. So we have only the 12-month scheme now. And that is the usual scheme. That is why the NPS are now normalized to 1.9%. Right. So, have you witnessed uh, any pressures with regards to liquidity due to the current uh, crisis that we've seen in the market? Because for a company like yourself with strong ROEs as well as huge capital tier one capital accretion, it should not be a bother for any uh, lender to you. See, we have been talking to uh, when all these uh, uh, problems came up or uh, the confusions came up in the financial market. We have been talking to the uh, to all the banks, to all the mutual funds, etc. And we, the general feeling we get is that they are all comfortable with the business model. All the banks who have lent us money have also got a small home loan portfolio. They know the strength of this home loan portfolio. It is just that they are not able to do this as well as both of it. The, micro, uh, the mutual funds also understand us very well. They are very confident. Today also, we have a, uh, we have a sizable uh, presence in the CP market from the mutual funds, and they are very comfortable. But uh, in the last two months, banks have been a little tight-fisted in uh, lending to uh, or renewing and lending to NBFCs in general. And probably we have also been uh, categorized there because Many of the banks say their overall exposure to NBFCs is high. So although they know that uh, they could give us more money, they are unable to do that because of their overall exposure limits. But now that uh, Reserve Bank has eased things a bit, things are looking up better, and they are also coming up with, uh, uh, with more uh, funding to us. But we are also in the process of uh, going forward with the retail NCDs because we have a very good retail NCD uh, franchisee and uh, we have a good customer base for that because we have been there for decades. People still trust Mutu and so we'll be going for retail NCDs also next month. All right. Uh, true. Uh, what, what would the quantum of that be, the NCDs? Yeah, probably, probably uh, the last one we raised last year was about 3,000 crores. So probably we'll do that and uh, we'll do a 3,000, something on that uh, level we should be looking at, but uh, the quantum is not uh, finalized as yet. So, we, but uh, it'll be done more frequently now. All right, just one last question, sir, before we let you go in terms of growth targets for FI19. Yeah, I told you the goal, uh, for FI19, the gold loan business, we would like to grow it by 15% uh, plus, and also the subsidiaries certainly uh, which should con which is today about constituting 10% of our total book. We would like it to reach 15%. Hopefully, it may reach thir uh, 13 or 14% of the total book, diversifying the uh, uh, the total business from overload to the housing finance. Uh, we, uh, and we have also started the vehicle finance business as a 100% subsidiary. It will be reflected in the next quarter. 
Got that. Mr. Muthu, thanks very much for joining in. Appreciate you taking out the time and highlighting uh, and clarifying all of those details for us. Uh, that's the management of Muthu Finance. So optimistic on growth, double digit growth uh, overall and uh, subsidiary business also likely to expand by the end of the year. Well, just before we wrap up the show, Devinado, just uh, want to mark two names yet again. HCL Tech is now down about 6%. So just a quick market up update there. That stock at 9.54 is at the lowest point of the day. Gale is 4.5% lower, I presume, on that CLSA note, which speaks about the Petcam business having a bit losses in quarter three. So that stock has corrected quite a bit as well. Otherwise, it's uh, largely okay. Uh, Z on the other side has gained about 3% and Pharma seems to be doing well. But I'm sure the FNO show will take forward all of these conversations. So it's a wrap on this leg of Indian Open from Devin and me and the team that put this show together. Thanks so much for watching.